Okay. Okay. So let's let's get started. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Neil Grant from Penn State. Uh, Neil was educated Caltech and uh, had a very short PhD at Cambridge, UK, three or four years, working with uh, Andy Fabian, and then another very short postdoc, one year postdoc at CFA, then joined the faculty at Penn State. So that means he told me if you are Cuban, you can do things very fast. So that's method for the student. Took a lot of work. No, you were very Cuban, you told me, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, he joined Penn State in the late 1990s. And now he's a, a distinguished chair professor at Penn State, at Germany. Uh, Neil has been a leader in high energy actual physics for not very old, for the last two decades. I think the <laughs> last few decades. And uh, particularly in observational energy and astronomy. Um, I checked your website. He has uh, more than 500 papers to his credit with his publications. So competitive with Avi Loeb at the celebration. <laughs> anyway, uh, covering many different areas, um, supermassive black holes, active galaxies, quasars, um, X-ray binaries, um, different kind of galaxies. And uh, he has also been a tremendous mentor to postdocs and students. I met a couple of them on the faculty in different places. And uh, Neil has uh, received a number of awards, including the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize, and also Rossi Prize from AAS, and among other awards. And uh, today he will, and also I, he told me that this is not the first time he is at, in Isaka. He actually visited Isaka many times, but this is his official visit to the department. So I'm very happy to, to correct that that uh, wrong mistake on uh, our part. And uh, so today he's going to lead us to have a hard, good hard look at, at supermassive black hole growth. New Thank you for having me. Uh, so today I would like to tell you about the results from some cosmic x-ray surveys. We've been blessed uh, over the past couple of decades to have a number of really superb x-ray missions operating. We've had uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the X-ray Multi-Mirror Mission Newton, and then more recently the, the New Star Observatory. I will be talking about results from all of these missions. They all work together very effectively, although for, for much of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on results uh, on the Chandra deep fields gathered with uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And again, th this talk is going to focus on supermassive black hole growth, uh, and that is primarily revealed by the study of active galactic nuclei. So I'll be talking a lot about active galactic nuclei in this talk. Um, I've been fortunate uh, to work with a number of really superb uh, students, as well as uh, postdoctoral researchers in my group over the years. Uh, and clearly, the work I'll be describing today draws from the efforts of, of all of these people. And so they all deserve a lot of credit, and it's been very gratifying to see many of them go off and have uh, exciting new careers in, in astrophysics in, in various directions. So, uh, and I also want to thank um, my, my colleagues, especially at, at Penn State. In, in my case personally, I'm extremely indebted to the members of the Chandra Advanced CCD Imaging Spectrometer Team. So most of the Chandra data that I'll be telling you about today was gathered with, with this detector here. This detector sits at the back of, of Chandra there, so the x-rays come in this way. They're brought to a focus by a set of mirrors on Chandra here. So the x-rays travel along this tube and, and are, are collected back here. This is a, a CCD-based x-ray detection system that was uh, envisioned and its, it's development was led by Professor Gordon Garmeyer, who was a Penn State professor for many years. He's now emeritus. And uh, he and his uh, team members, some of whom are, are shown here, um, you know, have made a lot of this possible. But one thing I want to mention just right from the outset is that um, x-ray studies using CCD-based detectors are, are really wonderful. Because your typical x-ray has about a thousand times the energy of a typical optical light bulb, it interacts with the CCD much more strongly, creating large numbers of electron-hole pairs in the semiconductor. And so uh, that gives you 
energy resolution, that is, we read out the CCDs here every 3.3 seconds on Chandra, and for every photon that interacts with the CCDs, we get energy and we also get timing information down to 3.3 seconds. And so it truly is an imaging spectrometer system. Where we're doing imaging and spectroscopy all at once. Um, so what I'd like to do today is start off by talking about the general utility of X-ray surveys of active galactic nuclei. I will use that abbreviation frequently. And you know, what, why bother to do these things? What are they good for? I will then talk about my favorite X-ray surveys, the Chandra Deep Fields. I'll then talk about some selected science results, and I'll end with future prospects. So let's start with the utility of, of X-ray surveys of active galactic nuclei. So uh, first of all, um, the X-ray emission uh, observed from active galactic nuclei is thought to come from the immediate vicinity of the black hole. And as of, I guess, last week, we all now know the black holes are real. Okay? <laughs> and so you know, we don't have pictures that look quite like this yet, but I guess we're getting close. Um, and uh, anyway, the X-ray emission is, is, again, thought to be made in the immediate vicinity of the supermassive black hole. It's thought to be made in a coronal structure, perhaps somewhat like the, the solar corona, but, but far more extreme. Um, ultraviolet photons from the accretion disk traveling upward through the coronal material are pumped and upscattered by billion Kelvin electrons and perhaps positrons, and that's what produces a lot of the X-ray emission that, that is observed. You can also have interesting processes where the X-rays that are produced in the corona shine back down upon the disk and irradiate it in interesting ways, and that produces lots of interesting spectral features. Now, while all of these, the details of exactly how this X-ray corona works it is still uh, a topic of active investigation, the one thing that we do know is that X-ray emission is nearly universal for luminous active galactic nuclei. You can always count on it being there. Unlike, for example, radio loud and radio quiet AGNs, where only a small fraction of active galactic nuclei are, are radio loud. And so X-ray selection um, relies in a fundamental way on this universality uh, of X-ray emission. I also want to point out that this, this coronal structure that I'm showing you here is a, is a dynamical one. This is a little movie version of that plot. And, and we actually observe strong, large amplitude, and rapid X-ray variability from these systems, indeed supporting the idea that the X-ray emission is made in the immediate vicinity of the black hole. Um, this is the, the broadband X-ray spectrum that we see. <clears throat> the exact details of this spectrum aren't, aren't so critical for the purpose of this talk. We observe a number of continuum components. We sometimes observe spectral features like an iron K-alpha line that's produced when X-rays shine down upon the accretion disk and irradiate it and so on. Uh, the point here that I, that I want you to draw from this is we observe X-ray emission from these active galactic nuclei over a very broad range of rest frame energies, okay? Starting down to, down, going down to at least 0.1 kV and running up to more than 100 kV. So there's a very broad stretch of the electromagnetic spectrum comparable to all the way running from the infrared out to the ultraviolet, okay, that's being captured here in the X-ray band. And, and to give you a, a sense of, of uh, the energy bands of Chandra and XMM Newton and New Star. Well, Chandra and XMM Newton, in their survey work, work most effectively between about 0.3 kV or so up to about 8 to 10 kV, up to around there. That's the band they cover. New Star, due to its specialized techniques of X ray imaging, actually extends the band for survey work up to about 16 kV, up to somewhat higher energies up to there. Okay, so again, we sample with these observatories very broad band passes. For example, the Chandra band pass is about 20 times the width of the entire optical band pass. So we have a very broad grip of the electromagnetic spectrum um, with, with these observatories. Okay, now the second reason why X-ray surveys are, are really great, um, combined with the universality of X-ray emission from active galactic nuclei, is that X-ray emission is, is penetrated. We all know this from the doctor's office or, or the dentist's office. And um, this is critically important because we know that well, we know that galaxies have lots of stuff in them, and this is particularly true in the immediate vicinity of the supermassive black hole. We know that the light from active galactic nucleus is usually substantially obscured, both by material in the immediate vicinity of the nucleus, as well as by material on the scale of galaxy. And X-ray emission, by virtue of its penetrating nature, can penetrate through a lot of that obscured material, and can allow you to not only penetrate through the obscured material, but also measure large column density. And that's in fact what's being shown here. This is the exact same plot that I just showed you back here. It's this spectrum, but now I'm adding absorption to it with different levels of, of, of column density as labeled there. 
And to give you a, a sense of context there, the common density through your hand, this is the common density of hydrogen, the common density through your hand is about 10 to the 23, the common density through your chest is about 10 to the 24. So that gives you sort of characteristic numbers that, that, that are applicable there. And you can see that the high energy x-ray emission can penetrate through large columns. You know, that's why they use them to look at your bones. Okay? If you look at your bones, they're using tens or somewhat more than 100 KV x-rays, and those x-rays can penetrate through very large amounts of obscuring material indeed. And that's critically important because we know, as I said, that, that this obscuration is common in active galactic, active galactic nuclei. So we need a way of finding the obscured systems as well as the unobscured systems. Another great thing applicable to the x-ray surveys that I'll be telling you about is this absorption bias actually drops going to high redshift. Because if you go to high redshift, the whole spectrum is cosmologically redshifted downward in energy. And you get access to increasingly penetrating rest frame x-rays. And your obscuration bias as you go out to the distant universe gets less and less, which is the opposite of what happens, for example, in the optical UV, where it gets more and more. And so um, x-ray surveys of the distant universe are extremely powerful indeed because you're sampling extremely high energy, extremely penetrating x-rays. Okay, um, and then finally, the, the third point uh, on the utility of these X-ray surveys is that X-ray emission has low dilution by host galaxy starlight. And that's illustrated here. This is an example just of a representative local active galactic nucleus. That's its name if you're interested. And this is the optical image, and that's the corresponding X-ray image. And the point here is that in the X-ray band, all of the starlight just drops out, and all you see is the black hole-related emission. Okay, so the point here is that x-rays are very effective at maximizing the contrast between black hole related light and starlight, and that lets you get the cleanest samples of active galactic, of active galactic nuclei out of the universe. Um, that's not the case, for example, when you try to do infrared selection of active galactic nuclei, where you find lots of AGM candidates, but you're never quite sure how much of the light is from the black hole related emission versus starlight emission. The x-rays clean that up very effectively. Now, the x-rays are, are not perfect. Best of all, as I'll show you in more detail in a little bit, is combining the X-ray surveys with multi-wavelength surveys. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a little bit. And then finally, for, for, for this section, I'll just mention that this, the, these positive aspects of, of um, X-ray surveys, the universality of X-ray emission, the penetrating nature, and the large contrast, uh, have led to a lot of X-ray surveys for active galactic nuclei being done. And this is a little schematic plot here that shows a selection of the X-ray surveys that have been done. This is the flux limit of a given survey versus the solid angle over which that survey has been conducted. And that's the whole sky over there. Okay? So we have a variety of surveys that have been done, ranging, ranging from all sky surveys, a low sensitivity, sort of medium depth surveys, to the very most sensitive surveys. Um, and each one of these data points represents an entire survey and a tremendous amount of work by many dedicated people. I'm just going to show you a few examples. First, I just want to show you this data point here. This is the Cosmos survey. Many of you probably have heard of the famous Cosmos field. This has been an extremely successful survey program. Here is the Chandra observations of the Cosmos field. This is a 160 kilosecond depth survey over 2.1 square degrees. And in total, you can see all of these point-like sources here. They detect about 4,000 point-like sources the majority of which are accreting supermassive black holes out in the distant universe. So that's an example of one of these surveys. I'll show you one other one quickly. That is, I'm going to show you the XXL survey over here. This is a survey done with XMM-Newton. Note the different colors here correspond to surveys done by Chandra, XMM-Newton, and then earlier missions in red. And so I'll now show you an example of an XMM-Newton survey, the XXL survey. This is a, a very large field survey. Here it is, it covers, it's, it's been done in two regions of the sky, each one of which obtains 25 square degrees, but it's a rather shallow survey, about a 10 kilosecond depth survey. This was in fact a survey that was driven by cluster uh, science, okay, not AGN science, but they did automatically detect large numbers, about 26,000 active galactic nuclei as well. They were able to detect in these wide field surveys, the rare luminous examples of active galactic nuclei although they miss most of cosmic accretion power because they're just too shallow to capture it. So those are two examples of surveys. But my, my favorite surveys of all are the Chandra Deep Fields, and that's what I'm going to focus on for most of the rest of this talk. So let's talk about the Chandra Deep Fields now. So the Chandra Deep Fields in, in this diagram are, are over here. They, they're the ultimate in pencil beam ultra-deep surveys. Okay, And here they are. <coughs> there, there, there are two of them. There's the Chandra Deep Field North, which is up on the sky, kind of near the Big Dipper, up on the sky, and there's the Chandra Deep Field South, which is down in the south in the constellation of Fornax. Okay? 
This one is a 2 million second Chandra observation. This one's a 7 million second Chandra observation. And these were gathered over extended periods of time. This one was gathered over 16 years. So we can look at the variability of all these X-ray sources over a 16 year time span. Um, each one of these fields covers about, well, these are the quantitative numbers, but it's of order 60% the size of a full moon on the sky. That's a sort of solid angle being covered by each one of these. And you can detect large numbers of sources. Here, somewhat more than 750. Here, here somewhat more than 1,000 X-ray sources, the majority of which are these accreting supermassive black holes in the distant universe. Okay? And remember that in, in these types of surveys that we do, we are not only doing imaging. Okay, every one of these sources has full spectroscopic information as well as full time variability information for all the sources. So it's an extremely rich data set where I can go and pick that source and look at how it's varied over two and a half years and look at its x-ray spectrum and pull it all apart. Okay, so it's an extremely rich data set in that sense. And um, just to sort of show you the ultimate depth, down here, the very central part of the Chandra Deep Field South, the imaging is best on axis. The imaging gets worse off axis. So here on axis, you actually can't see the sources very well. But if I zoom in, here's the very central part of the Chandra Deep Field South. The sources are color coded by their X-ray spectral information. And to give you a sense of how, how well Chandra was built, the faintest sources we detect down here in the very central part of the Chandra Deep Field South are such that we're getting about one photon coming in every 10 days on average. Okay? So photon comes in, it's going to be 10 days before you can count on another. Okay, so Chandra has been built so well that it can work totally effectively in that regime. And in fact, it could go even deeper if we exposed even more. Why yeah. No one is more efficient. Why the what? You only have 20% more sources. Ah, right. It, um, it, it's because, you, it's because we're, we're, we're getting beyond the break in the, in, in the number counts. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. But there's very good reasons to go very deep. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we have picked these these two these two surveys, of course, um, carefully. We we located them in the sky very carefully and reached the truly superb Milky Way data. You all, I'm sure, know this famous image. This is the the famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The Hubble Ultra Deep Field sits right down in the middle of the Chandra Deep Field South. It's right there. Okay. Furthermore, there's been truly extensive Hubble Space Telescope surveying in the, in the southern region as well as in the northern region. I'm going to focus on the south for now. Here is the, the famous Good Survey, shown in red, and the famous Candles and 3D HST Survey, shown there in blue. And in total, in fact, if you look in the Hubble archives, and this is kind of amusing, um, you, you find that there's actually about 6 million seconds of Hubble time that's now been sunk into the Chandra Deep Field South region as well. That's about 70% of a Hubble cycle, because Hubble has a rather low observing efficiency. And if you price that out over Hubble's lifetime, that's about a $250 million investment of Hubble time. And so it really does seem worthwhile to extract the most one can from this data, because there's been an enormous investment of, of time on these survey fields. OK, there's also really superb uh, multi-wavelength data across the electromagnetic spectrum. Extremely deep spectroscopy from the largest telescopes on Earth. Um, really superb infrared data from the ground as well as from Spitzer and Herschel in space. Now there, there is, um, there's been extensive surveying in the submillimeter with the Apex telescope, and now uh, ALMA has been doing extensive targeted follow-up studies of all the Apex sources, and there's also really superb radio surveying uh, with the VLA and other facilities uh, for the Chandra Deep Fields out. And all this, all these multi-wavelength data are really quite essential for identifying the X-ray sources, figuring out what they are, classifying them, measuring their host galaxy properties, and so on. And I'll talk a lot more about that in a little bit. And this continues to improve rapidly, and this is one, one essential thing that's been keeping the science exciting. Not only do the X-ray data get better and better as we expose more and more over the years, but the multi-wavelength data gets better and better as well. And so that, that's another reason that, that, that this is, uh, keeps us all very exciting and, and sort of fresh. Um, here is, is the current status of counterparts and redshifts, which is you know, absolutely essential before you can start doing any science. You have to get reliable counterparts and reliable redshifts. So in fact, owing to Chandra's superb um, imaging, gives you sub-arc second x-ray positions typically, um, we have 98.4% of the x-ray sources with reliable multi-wavelength counterparts, and 97.8% of those have redshifts. The majority of those now, owing to so much spectroscopic time being sunk into this field, into this field um, are spectroscopic redshifts. About 33% of them are photometric redshifts. This here shows the histogram for the photometric redshifts. 
they really are quite superb because we have about 40 bands of multi-wavelength data that we can use to constrain the photometric redshift. They're typically good to within a couple percent, although there are some catastrophic uh, photo-Z failures. Um, here is, are the redshift distributions for the active galactic nuclei, the majority source population, which I'll show in red. And then we also are detecting populations of X-ray binaries in distant galaxies as well, which I'll, I'll show in here in blue. And you can see the AGN span all the way from relatively low redshift, sort of picking up in numbers around redshift of a half or so, and running all the way out pretty effectively out to redshift of about four. So we are spanning the vast majority of cosmic time in the survey for the active galactic nuclei. The galaxies are seen typically at lower redshifts. And then if you finally bin uh, the redshift, you can see there are various spikes here corresponding to known large scale structures in the Chandra Deep Field South region, all the way out to redshifts of two and a half that are, uh, that, that are being traced by the active galactic nuclei. So you see large scale structures out there as well. Here are some examples of the X-ray sources. Okay, so each one of these is a 12 arc second by 12 arc second Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope imaging um, of the relevant X-ray source, which is shown as the little circle. The size of the circle corresponds to the X-ray positional uncertainty. And, and these images are made from the combination of B-band, Z-band, and uh, infrared uh, imaging with Hubble. And um, in each one of these, uh, the redshift is, is labeled here and with, with a P indicating that it's a, it's a photometric redshift and an S indicating that it's a spectroscopic redshift. So you can see we have large numbers of sources which are all superbly characterized in terms of their morphological properties. And because we also have infrared coverage, we can measure things like star formation rates and, uh, and we can measure stellar masses and so on for these galaxies. And I'll show you some more. So we have page after page of these things. This is just one page. Oops, I did something bad. Here we are. Um, here, here's the next page. Okay, so here's some more of these things, okay? And I label them either as AGN or as galaxy, depending upon the source type. Here's another page. And in total, we have like 30 pages like this. And so what we're doing to learn about the properties of, of the host galaxies of AGN is we're analyzing all these data in a statistical manner to try to characterize what are, where do black holes in the universe like to grow. Okay, so that, that's the source characterization. Here are uh, the number counts. Um, and so here we're basically just counting the number of sources, the number of X-ray sources we detect as, a, as, as you go down an X-ray flux for, well, active galactic, well, for all sources in black, for the active galactic nuclei in blue, for, again, galaxies, that's when you're detecting the X-ray binary populations of galaxies, in individual relatively nearby galaxies in red, and then for galactic stars, we detect some of them as well there in, in, in green. And you can see that the AGN number counts now reach about 23,000, actually almost 24,000 per square degree through the very center of the Chandra Deep Field South. And so this, of course, is a representative patch of sky. If you scale it up the entire sky, that's telling you that down at this flux, there's about a billion active galactic nuclei across the sky. So more than enough for everyone. Um, the, uh, the, the survey here, and another point to just to sort of compare with is that if you compare the effectiveness of AGN selection with the X-ray based technique compared to, for example, the deepest optical AGN surveys, we're finding about 20 times more AGN than they can find. And again, the reason for that is we can find all the obscured systems and we can find all the systems where the host galaxy light is really <coughs> present uh, because that is not contaminating the X-ray selection approach. Okay, and so the X and, and the X-ray selection, I will just say, compares very well the selection of other wavelengths particularly if you consider purity. When we say something is an AGN, we're highly confident we're correct. And we are then resolving up to about 8 kV, 80-90% of the cosmic X-ray background. Um, I also just want to mention briefly, we are detecting a large population of cosmologically distant normal and starburst galaxies, where again, we're detecting the X-ray binary population in those. And there, interestingly, at the, ver the very faintest soft band fluxes, those are now overtaking the active galactic nuclei in numbers. In the very central part of the deep field south, they're actually more common. And um, you know, they will be the dominant X-ray source, dominant even fainter X-ray flux in the future missions. Okay, so now I want to focus on some selected science results from these surveys. There, there's a lot I could talk about here. Uh, these surveys allow diverse science in all sorts of directions. I'm just going to pick two topics here to sort of give you a highlight of some of the things that, that we're focusing on. And again, I'm going to focus on supermassive black hole-related science. There's lots of other interesting things with transients and 
um, again, the, the, the galaxy population, even the stars and so on. But uh, again, I'm going to focus on the, the accreting supermassive black holes. First, I want to talk about some work uh, that's um, been led by a very good graduate student I've had over the last <coughs> couple of years. He, in fact, just got his PhD about a month ago, his name's Wang Yang. And um, I gave him a, a nice challenging project for his PhD thesis. Here it is. This is the question I gave him. I want, so I want you to figure out what matters for cosmic supermassive black hole world. Modest problem. Okay. And um, I, what, what I mean by that is I wanted him to figure out what properties of galaxies really drive black hole growth. Is it stellar mass? You might think that you know, galaxies of larger stellar masses with have deeper potential wells, they can hold down the gas better, so you might be able to feed the black hole better. Or is it star formation rate? You also might think that, well, the presence of cold gas needed to form stars would also be relevant to the feeding of black holes, so maybe star formation rate would connect very tightly. Or is it environment? Um, you know, we know for example that massive galaxies tend to live in richer environments, so maybe environment's the important thing. And he's written a series of papers pulling apart these things, usually using partial correlation analyses. I won't go through all of what he did in his thesis, but I want to show you one very nice result from his thesis. And it's the work I'm going to tell you about is motivated by these famous relations, which have been known now for about two decades, between the masses of supermassive black holes, shown along here on the y-axis, and the properties of galactic bulges. And what's shown along here is essentially the, 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 the absolute magnitude in the K-band of the bulge, which essentially is telling you about the mass of the bulge. Here is showing the velocity dispersion of the stars in the bulge. And you can see that black hole masses have significant correlations okay, with the properties of the bulge. And this is quite striking, remember, because the relative size of the black hole compared to the size of the bulge is comparable to that of a pebble compared to the Earth. Yet somehow these two things on radically different scales correlate with each other. And that's not true for other galaxy components. If you look, for example, at the entire stellar mass of a galaxy, so this is the black hole's mass versus the entire stellar mass of the galaxy, the correlation is much less clear. You can see that there. Similarly, if you look at the relation between the black hole's mass and the mass of the disk of a galaxy, that's essentially a scatter plot. Okay, so there really is something special about the bulges. And so that led us to home in on the critical role of morphology. If you're going to be able to look for really fundamental relations between black holes and host galaxies, you've got to be able to measure these bulge components. And this is not easy to do in the distant universe. Um, you need Hubble Space Telescope imaging resolution at the least. You prefer even better than that. And um, you also need um, if you want to go out to the distant universe especially, you need this high resolution imaging to be done out in the infrared so you don't suffer from very strong morphological K-correction effects uh, of galaxies out in the distant universe. And, and so what we've done is we've utilized the candle survey, which is, a, again, a superb Hubble Space Telescope infrared imaging survey okay, in five fields including the two Chandra Deep fields, as well as a couple of other very well-studied survey fields. And we've utilized 10,302 galaxies in those fields. And these fields, uh, these galaxies have the best possible um, morphological measurements available out in the distant universe, made in the H-band um, with a machine learning-based technique. And for example, using their morphological classifications, you can separate galaxies into bulge-dominated galaxies, which I show here in this, this top red frame set of cutouts, as well as non-bulge-dominated galaxies, which I show down here in this set of this blue frame set of cutouts. So we can morphologically separate things into at least bulge-dominated and non-bulge-dominated. And the idea, the motivation for why we're doing that is to remove non-bulge components at least for the bulge dominant <coughs> sample. Because then, if, for example, you go and measure the star formation rate of these, these, syst these systems, well, the star formation rate of them is going to be dominated by the bulge, because that's surely the dominant stellar component. Okay? And so the hope is that by focusing in on measuring <coughs> just the bulge components, knowing that the bulges are what correlate with black hole properties, perhaps we can see some relation. What we were essentially aiming to do was to look for the derivative of this plot. Okay, the derivative of the, of the black hole's mass is, is the black hole accretion rate. The derivative of the stellar mass is the star formation rate. So we were trying to make the derivative of this diagram. 
Okay, and, and that's what we've been working to do. Um, I'll tell you how we did it now. And uh, again, but the idea, as I just highlighted, is the supermassive black hole growth is probably related to the star formation rate called the bulge only. So we're trying to home in on bulge dominated systems to exclude other stellar components of galaxies that do not correlate very well with black hole growth. Okay, this is some details of our sample. Uh, and I want to go back to this plot, which I showed you earlier. This again is the central part of the Chandra D field south. And I want to highlight now the methodology we use to measure black hole growth which is not an easy thing to measure. And, and this is true for, for a number of reasons. I'm going to focus on one in particular. And, and that goes back to uh, what I often think about when I, I'm looking at this image. I spend a lot of time looking at this image. It's been a good fraction of the past 20 years looking at this image. And um, I, I always you know, ask myself, well, OK, th this is a great image right now. But you know, what would this look like in a million years? If I went and redid the Chandra Deep Field South experiment in a million years or in 10 million years, would it be the same pattern of spots up on the sky or not? Okay, We know that active galactic nuclei very strongly, certainly on human timescales, and on timescales of a million years, they likely vary substantially more. Okay, So when I look at this image, I don't really think of it as you know, a set of special galaxies which are growing their black holes, none of the other galaxies do. I think of this as a statistical sampling of the types of galaxies that tend to grow their black holes. So to measure long-term average black hole growth, to try to beat out, beat down this, this sort of variability component that, that will affect our measurements, well, unless you can go out to observe observational time scales of a million years, you're going to have to average over samples. So what we, what we do is we take samples of galaxies with a given set of, galactic, given set of properties, and we measure the average black hole growth across them, either by directly measuring the observed X-ray flux or by stacking up their signal to get an average constraint. And, and that's what we've, we've been doing. And, and with that sort of an approach, you can actually look for very interesting connections between black hole growth and galaxy growth. Here, for example, is a plot that shows star formation rate versus our measurement computed via this averaging process I've just described. Okay, um, And what we find, quite strikingly, is in our bulge-dominated sample, the sample where we expect the black hole growth and the galaxy growth to be related, we find that the long-term average black hole accretion rate, the derivative of the black hole's mass, correlates quite nicely with the star formation rate. Okay, And the correlation is actually appears to be a pretty simple linear correlation. And we observe it both at riches of a half to 1.5 and at riches of 1.5 to 3. Whereas, if you look at a comparison sample of non-bulge dominated galaxies, again, I'm keeping the color scheme consistent, so the red and the blue here corresponds to the same red and blue galaxies that I was showing you back here. Okay, these, these systems, oops, back here, these, oops, here, these systems shown here, um, you do not see a nice clear correlation for them. And that's kind of as you would expect, because again, we, we observe in the local universe that black hole masses don't correlate very well with non-bulge components of galaxies. Okay? So this is one thing that we find. And to firm this up, we perform partial correlation analyses to really break this down into a strict quantitative sense. And here are the results of the partial correlation analyses. What you should really focus on are, are the, 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 the bold-faced numbers here, and you can see that if you look at bulge dominated galaxies, the dependence upon the dependence of black hole accretion rate upon star formation rate is much stronger okay, than that upon, for example, stellar mass. And that's when we have them fight against each other in a partial correlation sense. And that's true at bold ridges of a half to 1.5, one and a half to three. Whereas from a comparison sample of galaxies, well, there in general the correlations are weaker, but they are there, but stellar mass actually appears to be the main correlate with black hole growth for them. So if you focus in on the bulge-dominated galaxies, you actually see this very nice connection okay, between black hole accretion <laughs> rate and star formation rate. And moreover, quantitatively, we can fit this relation. Okay, It's actually consistent in both redshift bins. And here is, in fact, the relation. We find that the log of the black hole accretion rate is the log of the star formation rate, and the offset's minus 2.48. Okay? And so we find that the, the, the ratio then of the black hole accretion rate averaged over long time scales to the star formation rate for bulk dominated galaxies is about one part in 302. And that's very similar to the typical ratio of black hole masses to bulge masses in the local universe. 
So we take this to be evidence for coevolution, okay, um, for, between the growth of black holes and the growth of their bulges. Because we appear, we, we observe this apparent lockstep growth of supermassive black holes and bulges. Other people have put forward models where they suggest that these, these relations between black holes and bulges are not truly really fundamental. They're purely the result of merger-based averaging. But we don't think that can be true because we can, we can directly observe the lockstep growth in the distant universe. There it is. Okay, it's pretty clear. And so, um, so, so that's the main result uh, that fr from this this specific work. And I will say that we have desires to, to improve these measurements in a number of ways in the future. Um, two of them are, are that well, we hope to extend our measurements of bulge star formation rates into more galaxies, not just the totally bulge dominated ones, but into ones that have other stellar components as well. It should be possible to do that in some degree with James Webb Space Telescope. <coughs> and we also have been proposing furiously over the past couple of weeks, writing all more proposals to actually measure that the gas supplies in these galaxies, which will be related to how much black hole and stellar growth you can actually expect in these systems. So we're working on that as well. So that's one example of some of the science that you can do with these surveys. Uh, and I want to talk about one other one. And um, this is some work that's been led by Fabio Vito, who was a, a very good um, postdoctoral researcher in my group until just recently. He has actually now moved to, to Chile. He wanted access to all the amazing Chilean observational facilities. So he's down there now um, doing follow-up studies of some of the things that, that we found. And um, Fabio's uh, main interests are on high redshift active galactic nuclei. He wants to learn about um, the luminosity function, for example, the very high redshift active galactic nuclei. He ultimately would like to understand how the first supermassive black holes came about and grew from seeds in the very early universe. That's been, been his emphasis. And um, he's done a lot of work in that. I'll just show you a couple of things. Um, here, here's one, here are a couple of results from one of his recent papers where he has done uh, very careful, technically demanding work to constrain the space density, shown here, and the obscured fraction, shown here, of active galactic nuclei out at high, out, of active galactic nuclei out at high ridges, ridges of three to five. Okay? And here, for example, um, he has constrained the decline at high redshift at for low and moderate luminosity active galactic nuclei. Of course, we've known for decades that the powerful quasars decline rapidly beyond a ratio of about three, and you can see that here with the blue data points. And that is confirmed by X-ray surveys at relatively bright X-ray fluxes. But you need the very great sensitivity of the Chandra D fields to go down to lower luminosity systems. And with a lot of careful work, he has now constrained the decline of um, Black, of, of the black hole number density for moderate luminosity systems in green and low luminosity systems in red. And if anything, strikingly, this is surprising, if anything, the decline um, at low and moderate extra luminosities, in fact, this appears to be slightly steeper than that of high luminosities, which is somewhat surprising because you might think that the lower mass systems would actually come <coughs> first and then they would build up. But if anything, they're actually getting rarer compared to the more massive systems in early times as far as we can measure things. Uh, he also has shown that the obscured fraction is very high out in the distant universe. We can detect the highly obscured fraction systems against these very high ridges very effectively because there's minimal bias from obscuration. So we detect them very effectively out in the distant universe, and we can see the obscuration fraction. What you correct for incompleteness effects is up around 10%. Okay, so that's one interesting thing that we found. Um, we also then have been trying to push the Chandra data even harder than that. And this and, and the motivation for that is shown here. People have now found powerful quasars out of ranges of six to seven, okay? With the Chandra deep fields, we can probe at somewhat lower redshift, but still quite high redshift, lower luminosity systems around here. But we'd really like to push back to very early times, because there are a lot of very interesting predictions people have made about how black holes may grow at very early times. Some people have proposed that you may start with the collapse of a stellar remnant, which then grows via, well, Eddington Limited or even hyper Eddington accretion, and that's what we require, nearly continuous Eddington Limited accretion to reach the masses we observe on ridges of six. Or other people have proposed that you may actually have fairly massive seeds. You may actually have the collapses of gas clouds out in the distant universe to form 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes directly. 
out of the distant universe. And we like to try to constrain these things. Well, this right now is a very challenging thing to do. You have to be able to access very faint X-ray fluxes. We can't do it in the most direct way with the Chandler Deep Fields, but we can start to make progress right now. And we, we do that with the technique of, of stacking. OK, so here, here is uh, my illustration of, of the stacking technique that we're applying to the X-ray surveys. This, this was, in fact, made by my, my graduate student, Brad Lemer. It probably is the, the favorite plot of mine that any of my graduate students have ever made. I thought it was very crazy what Brent did. So Brent did a lot of stacking work for his, his PhD thesis. And um, I call it the romantic example because he made this plot right when he was about to propose to his girlfriend. I am very excited about the story. So, um, so, so what he did here is he took a bunch of tea candles and he put them on his stairs, okay? And he took an exposure with his canvas, a three one hundred second exposure, and there it is, okay? And then he took another exposure of those same tea candles with a 1 1,000 second exposure. And there, there those exposures are. Okay? And the whole idea of this stacking is that if this stacking works, you should be able to add up all of these low signal to noise images and recover something that looks like that. And here is the stacked image. You stack up 30 of the candles with a 1 1,000 second exposure each. You get a 3 100 second exposure, the same as that. And there you go. You recover the flame very nicely. You can actually recover the candle's wax down there. You can see the wick and everything, so it works. Okay, so, so that's the stacking technique. It really does work remarkably well. And Brett's girlfriend, of course, did say yes. So. <laughs> I would say no with one like that. Right. So, okay. so, so we use that exact same technique okay, um, to constrain the seeds of the first black holes. Um, what we do is we utilize samples of high redshift optically and infrared selected galaxies in the Chandra Deep Fields and we stack up their X-ray signals, okay? Um, with essentially the same technique I just showed you with candles. Um, and we take samples of individually undetected galaxies between about 100 and up to about 1400 per redshift band. I'll give you the details of that in a minute. And we stack them all up and try to get average X-ray detection. And this here actually shows the results. Here are the results for galaxies with a redshift of three and a half to four and a half. And here, um, for example, this is the case where we have lots of galaxies. This is where we have about 1,400 galaxies. So you stack all those galaxies up, each of which has about a seven million second Chandra exposure, and our total exposure is 8.2 gigasecond Chandra exposure. That's about 265 years of Chandra time on the average galaxy. And there it is. You can pull it right up. Okay, you can take the X-ray emission from it. Here it is, which is a four and a half to five and a half. There's a 2.7 gigasecond Chandra observation. We can pull up the signal. And then it reaches a five and a half to six and a half. We can't detect it on average right now, but we get a very useful upper limit. These, these panels here at the top are shown for all masses. The ones down here are shown where we just confine ourselves to the, the most massive half of our galaxy. And you can see that most of the signal of that comes from the most massive half of our galaxy. Okay, so we can use this to go to very fantastically sensitive X-ray depths, at least on average. Okay, and we, when we do modeling of the observed X-ray signals that we detect, we find that the signal here is consistent with mostly being from the expected population of X-ray binaries in these distant massive galaxies. And I have a student, Brett Lieber, who actually has calibrated out exactly what, how much X-ray binary emission there should be in high redshift galaxies. Um, and we find that our constraints, which I'll, I'll show here, are, are very powerful for constraining the amount of black hole growth across the entire galaxy population at a high redshift. And this plot here, it, it has a lot of stuff going on, but basically it shows a bunch of theoretical predictions for early black hole growth. That's what all these various colored curves are. You don't have to worry about every detail. It's all they are labeled over here. Okay, and then these are our measurements. That the large black dot are our measurements of the directly X-ray detected systems. Okay, and these here are our constraints from the X-ray stacking. And these are such that the, the circles are for when we stack all the galaxies, and the squares are when we detect just the most massive half of galaxies. Okay, and the point here you can see is when you add up the emission from all the possible high redshift galaxies we know about in the distant universe, they still don't measure up to what we can detect individually. So that's telling us essentially that most high redshift supermassive black hole accretion occurs in that short AGN phase. There is really no room to hide any significant component of continuous low rate accretion that could, you know, at a slow rate, build up black hole masses. And furthermore, when we can add together our constraints, both from the stacking and from the direct detections, you can see our constraints are well below what the vast majority of the models are. 
And so all those models, we're pretty convinced, have to be wrong and will need substantial revision to match our new x-ray constraints. And there really is very little wiggle room, because once you stack everything, there's no room to hide it. You can't say that, well, there, maybe there's some accretion we missed, because we've stacked everything that there is. And so we have very tight constraints right now. And our constraints upon the luminosity function arising from this actually right now are, they aren't firm by any means, but they are pointing us toward, in fact, the possibility of there being massive seeds that stimulates black hole growth effectively out in the distant universe. That, that's constrained by the slope of the luminosity function that we measure. Okay, and we hope to push this technique substantially further soon. Um, we, in fact, have already pushed it as, as high redshift as we can um, using uh, stacking, uh, via stacking sample, via stacking of samples of Lyman Drake galaxies in the distant universe. Here are our constraints at ridges of four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, and we've made a lot of progress already, setting useful constraints, although right now we don't get detections out of these very high red shifts. But we are looking forward very much to the James Webb Space Telescope, which will provide us with larger samples of galaxies at higher red shifts, as well as giving us better red shift identifications and better removal of low red shift interlopers. We'll have much cleaner samples, you know, end to end. And so we aim to push this stacking technique, you combine with the James Webb Space Telescope, out to red shifts of 10 to 15, with the large sample of high rich of galaxies that are expected from JWST, and that should give us much tighter constraints still on black hole seeds in the distant universe. And so we have plans to push those things in the future. Okay, I want to then end uh, the talk. Yeah, okay, I want to end the talk uh, by talking about some, some future prospects for X ray surveys of active galactic nuclei. Okay, so. Uh, first of all, I just want to point out that Chandra and Exima Newton, which have both been going since now 1999, are still healthy and are still doing great. Okay? Um, this little schematic here shows a breakdown um, from a paper by Wilkes uh, showing a, a breakdown component by component of all of Chandra's subsystems. The technical details of the plot don't matter, but essentially the, these are color coded such that I believe the, the blue means there's no known problems operating essentially as well as when they launched 20 years ago. The green means there's minor problems, but it's meeting all requirements. And then the, the yellow means that there, there, there's moderate problems, but it's manageable. And so right now, Chandra, for example, is doing very well. And it could conceivably go for another decade. There's nothing that's going to run out that's going to make Chandra stop working. Okay? Uh, the CCD detector keeps going and going and going. Uh, being red, red out every 3.3 seconds for 20 years now, it just keeps going and going and going. Okay, so it's wonderful. And so, um, you know, we hope to get another decade out of it. And the same is true for XMM Newton. They can probably get another decade out of it as well. And so we hope for another great five to ten years of X-ray surveys. But I think if we're going to uh, make real progress in the future, I don't think doing more of what we did for the past 20 years is the right approach. I think we should take out some really aggressive projects with Chandra and XMM. Really big things that were, you know, unconceivable, inconceivable in the early years of Chandra and XMM. And I, I've been pushing that pretty hard. Um, one thing I've been pushing, working on in, in recent um, years is a survey called XMM Serves. This is a, a technical term. This is the Spitzer Extragalactic Representative Volume Survey. Essentially, you should think of this survey as getting good X-ray coverage of the LSSTD drilling field. I'm also highly involved in LSST. I'm very excited about LSST. I'm even more excited now that it's become real. This is a real picture of LSST. It's nice to know that we can still build things in the US. Okay? Okay. They're actually you know, building a real exciting, real exciting observatory, which we'll have to work on. There, there's a truck down there for comparison. Okay? And um, again, LSST should have a system first light in mid-2021. It should start full science operations in 2022, 2023. Um, here's a nice, nice plot, a nice, nice image. This, this in fact, is, is the ship upon which the primary tertiary mirror for LSST is currently sitting on and is being shipped down to Chile right now. This ship has just gone through the Panama Canal. It is now on its route down to Chile. It will be there in a few days, and then we'll be taking this mirror up the mountain and putting it in that facility. Okay, so it's, it's becoming real, which is very exciting. Okay? Um, I've been working on LSST since 2005, and so it's been a long wait, um, but I'm very exciting. Um, one thing LSST is going to do is, in addition to conducting its primary 18,000 square degree survey over the southern sky, it has selected a few fields, its so-called deep drilling fields, that it is going to observe much more intensively. 
the details of exactly how they're going to be observed is still being are still being settled, but essentially these fields should be observed at least in order of magnitude more intensively than the general LSSD survey. Um, the fields <coughs> that, that were chosen, in fact, I, I actually led the selection of these fields back in 2012, are well the Cosmos field, that really superb field survey field I mentioned to you, uh, another very well studied survey field, XMM LSS, the Chandra Deep Field South is probably my favorite, and the Elias S1 field. Those are the four fields. And each one of these fields will have, well, LSST field size is 10 square degrees. So these black circles here represent the LSST field size, and all of these colored circles and squares and rectangles and so on show the multi wavelength coverage for these fields. These fields have, the reason why we chose these fields is they have the best available multi wavelength data. And they were chosen and announced back in 2012 to stimulate the gathering of further multi-wavelength data by limited lifetime facilities. So that why by the time LSST got up and going, the data would be there, it would be off to the races and ready to go. Okay? For example, and that has worked. Um, for example, the, the, the gray scaling here shows the Spitzer coverage. Based on the fact that these fields were chosen, it was possible to get extensive Spitzer coverage over well, the full fields for at least three of the, the deep drilling fields, and at Cosmos, in fact, is being covered more extensively presently with, with Spitzer. And so there's going to be really superb Spitzer coverage, and that was possible because these fields were announced early on and it made possible to do all this follow-up work. I've been doing similar follow-up work in the X-ray band because it became apparent that if you look at all the multi-wavelength data across these fields, and, and this shows, I don't expect you to read this plot in detail, but it shows all the multi-wavelength data from the radio to the far infrared to the mid infrared to the near infrared to the optical photometry and the optical spectroscopy. There really was superb coverage all the way from the radio to the UV, but there was no real X-ray <coughs> coverage on several square degree scales. And so this was a glaring omission, and, and we set off to try to fix it. And so I started proposing about five years ago for this program. And they rejected me a few times and told me I was crazy and told me to go away. And I kept going, and eventually we got it, okay, which is very exciting. And so um, here, here is the basic program. Um, it's a five million second, very aggressive, large program with XMM Newton called XMM Serves. And we are adding to Cosmos, which already has two square degree coverage. We're adding four and a half square degrees in XMM LSS. 4.1 square degrees in the deep field south, and 3 square degrees in LISS-1. We actually already have all these data done and on the ground and actually published. These data are incoming right now, and these data will start being observed in a couple months. Uh, we're observing them at, at 50 kilosecond depth with XMM Newton. In total, when all this surveying is done, we expect about 12,000 active galactic nuclei and about 760 X-ray groups and clusters across these fields. Um, this should allow us to do exciting science immediately. We want to uh, constrain supermassive black hole growth as a function of cosmic environment, and we also want to do more work on supermassive black hole galaxy connections with really superb data and overwhelming sample statistics. So that's what we're going to be working on soon in, in those fields. And these fields, of course, as I said, will have incredible legacy value. These are LSSTD drilling fields, so there, having the X-ray selected AGN samples will give us a superb ground truth sample of AGN that we can use to calibrate LSST-based AGN selection, which we can then scale up to the full 18,000 square degrees of LSST. Um, these are also going to be targeted very extensively with moons on the VLT and, and PFS on Subaru. And, as, and of course, these fields are superbly located for ALMA uh, follow-up. There's been very extensive ALMA follow-up that is ongoing in, in these fields as well. I'll just say a few words about them. So here are the results for the XMM LSS field very quickly. Here are all the X-ray sources. In, the, in this field, we have now about 5,200 X-ray sources. Um, we have about already, just from all the superb multi wavelength data, we've got a 90% good identification rate as assessed for Chandra. And, and this is work that's been led by Chen Ping Chen, who, who's, a, who, who's a very good postdoc in my group. There's a tremendous amount of work on this. And in our prime four and a half square degrees, more than 70% of the sources have spectroscopic or high quality photometric redshifts already, just straight out of the box. We have 70% redshift rate. Okay, here is the redshift distribution for them. And the redshifts will come along, come along and get much better as soon as the extensive moons and PFS spectroscopy is done. Um, we right now are getting the, the Chandra Deep Field South data. And so this shows, this is, the, this is the main central Chandra Deep Field South that Sky Region I've been talking about for most of this talk. We are now adding all these additional survey fields, not nearly as deep as that, 
but over a much larger solid angle. The red ones here are the ones that we've already gotten, and the, the sort of gray or black dotted circles are the ones that will come soon. This is work that's being led, led by, by Quinling Ni. She's a very good uh, graduate student in my group right now. We currently have about half of our data. We've detected about 1,900 x-ray sources. We already have a 90% identification rate on counterparts. And we already have assembled all the multi-wavelength data and computed photos these. And so we're ready to go on all of these sources as they all come in. In total, we have about 3,400 x-ray sources in this field. And um, the multi-wavelength data are also picking up in these fields. Um, Meerkat, uh, via the MITEI survey, uh, is um, actually doing surveying right now to very great, radio, very great radio sensitivities across these fields. Uh, I've seen some of their data in Cosmos already, which looks fantastic, so that'll be exciting in the near future. Uh, furthermore, about a couple of these fields, I believe it's um, Cosmos, uh, XMM LSS, and the Channel Deep Field South, will likely be chosen as uh, LMT uh, survey fields with Toltec, so that will give good uh, wide area sub-millimeter surveying, and that will lead a lot to interesting sub-millimeter sources that can be followed up with Alma. Um, also, there's a, an ongoing program now called DEVILS, which is using the AAT to do extensive, uh, extensive spectroscopic redshift surveying. And as I mentioned, moons and PFS will, will soon uh, dramatically improve the uh, redshift uh, complete, completeness on these surveys. And I'll end just by saying a few words about future X-ray missions. So clearly, um, in addition to using Chandra and X and then Newton as best possible while they still have life, we'd like to, of course, build new missions. And there are things coming along there. Um, one thing I want to point out to begin with is that there's a, a very exciting mission called the Rosita that should be launching in June 2019, okay, so just in a couple of months. This is a, a um, all-sky X-ray surveying instrument on the Spectrum Roken Gamma satellite, and Erosita will conduct an all-sky survey that's about 30 times more sensitive than any current all-sky survey in the X-ray band to detect about 3 million active galactic nuclei. And, um, and then it will also do a survey near the ecliptic poles to greater sensitivity. So that will be very exciting. Um, there, we're also um, very excited about um, missions like Athena. One frustration for me is that you know I love the Chandra Deep Fields, but the frustration there's only two of them. Um, I'd like for there to be 100. But um, that's not an easy thing to do because these are very expensive to do with Chandra. But a mission like Athena, which will launch in the early 2030, should be able to bang out ch nearly Chandra deep field sensitivity observations much more efficiently. It should give us a lot more solid angle, for example, to constrain high ridge of the EGM populations and the environmental dependence of black hole growth. And it will also have a much larger collecting area uh, to give um, much better X ray source characterization. We also are working on mid X missions. For surveying as well. Um, and then finally, we are presently, I would say, perhaps dreaming um, about uh, a very aggressive future mission called, called LYNX. It, it's also known as the X-ray Surveyor. <coughs> so this is a mission that would be a lot like Chandra. It would have Chandra-like angular resolution, but it would utilize substantial improvements in mirror technology, in particular our ability to build uh, high-quality X-ray mirrors much, with, with much lower mass to achieve about 30 to 50 times the collecting area of Chandra. It would also have a much larger field of view, and then totally you could aim to reach something like 40 times the sensitivity of Chandra. So Lynx, in this diagram I've shown several times, would be down there. It would allow us to go far beyond the Chandra deep fields. And for example, with Lynx at a ridge of 10, you could aim to detect the black holes, the black hole seeds, like 30,000 solar mass black holes out of ridges of 10. And that would let us directly discriminate between the sort of low mass population three star remnants versus the direct collapse black hole scenarios that I was talking about with using the luminosity functions and, and the hosts of those seeds. So that'd be very exciting for the future. Here is our, our simulation of what links would be like. So this is the current seven megasecond Chandra deep field south. And here's what a one megasecond links observation would look like. You see all these faint sources that it very clearly detects that are beyond Chandra's detection sensitivity. That's what we could aim to do in the future. And um, so that's something to, to we all are, are dreaming about, and I will stop there. So thank you. Thank you much, Thank Questions? No question. So sure. around these uh, thousand sources in the uh, Chandra South field, yes. are there the apologies? 
Are there anything that's undergoing merger? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We have, we have a good number of merger systems as well. I don't know if I have any here. <coughs> I, I showed these little cutouts, but this is just a small fraction of all of our cutouts. Um, I don't know if I have any merger systems there or not. But certainly, certainly we do have merger systems among yeah. these. But, but, they, but, but they're not that common. Um, the, the, and that fact, the fact that we don't observe lots of merger systems among these has been used to argue that the feeding for these moderate luminosity machines is probably primarily via secular um, methods rather than by black hole merger, rather than by, by galaxy mergers. Okay, so are there like, among the small number of merging, merging systems, yeah. mm -hmm. you have this M dot measure? Correct. Yes, it be. Correct. Are, you have higher, are they higher? Are they lower? I don't believe, I, I would want to go check before I spoke definitively, but I don't believe they stand out as being higher on average. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Dominic? Yeah. Nice talk. Um, if you go to the black hole accretion history plot, I mean, of course, the uh, higher redshift. Which one? Which one? Describe which one you're after. Uh, what were the stacking, of the end of the stacking analysis? Uh, over here? Uh, you're, talking, uh, you're talking about like, like this. Oh no! You you want uh, you want you want this, yes, one. this one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you look at the diagram, so um, of course with um, the high redshift points is sensitive to um, if there would be a number of um, AGM that is in the X-rays because of obscure conflict. Um, so what are the estimates that we could have at these high redshifts of what role that might play? The obscuration effects. Yeah, the obscuration right. effects. Right. Okay, yeah. Well, certainly, first of all. At these high redshifts, we are we are sampling very penetrating X-rays. Obviously, okay, we're getting up to 40 keV X-rays, so that tends to minimize those obscuration effects pretty effectively. But we do admit they could be there, um, and again, we, we do see a significant obscure fraction, as I alluded to here. We do see a significant obscure fraction, um, but we don't detect um, we don't detect lots of systems that have the signature of um, you know, Compton thick. Uh, obscuration being present. That has a characteristic signature of a very hard X-ray continuum and all kinds of data emission. So we, you know, it could be there. Um, we, I think it's plausibly there at the 20, 30 percent level. I don't think it's going to be a factor two. Um, we, we, we have worked with that problem very hard down at lower ranges, which is one to two, where we have very good constraints on it. And again, it's, it's 30 percent effects. It's not, and we used to think it could be factor two, factor of four. But we, we really pin that down. Uh, we've made a lot of progress pinning that down. Um, we can also, well, we have, we have other techniques using the full SEDs of these galaxies, which I can tell you about later if you're interested. But, but we, we don't think somehow that that's going to radically elevate this up to there or something like that. I think that would be a very tough sell. Uh, um, at the beginning, you mentioned that you detect the uh, one X-ray photon every 10 days for a very big source. Yes, correct. And I mean, a 10 uh, megasecond observation that's still only two and a half months to be two. Correct. One detection is eight photons. Correct. Okay, we get down to our painted sources are five photons. So, how secure is your detection? I mean, 100%. I, I bet my house on it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet my house on it. I can tell you why. Yeah. What? One photon is not. No. Uh, I, I think we're secure up around three and four is where we're secure. And I, I can tell you there's many reasons for that. The, one of the main ones you can actually see directly here. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'm just jumping around here a bit. But um, here, for example, th this is the direct photon image. If you turn off the lights, maybe. This is the direct photon image of the seven megasecond exposure. Okay, after seven megaseconds, most of our pixels are zeros. The background can be screened out very effectively. These are real zeros. Okay, after 7 million seconds of exposure, which is fantastic. Okay? And so we, we are truly down to the Poisson regime. So you just work out what's the Poisson probability of four photons when the expectation value is one one hundredth of a photon. And there you go. Okay? That's one point. The second point, the reason why I would bet my house on it, that's not good enough for me to bet my house. The reason why I bet my house on it is we can look at the rate at which those positive fluctuations correlate with galaxies optically. And they correlate with galaxies almost perfectly. Whereas if you just pick random positions on this guy, they don't correlate with galaxies. So that makes it a slam dunk for me. Yeah. 
Yes, go ahead. So, you uh, found a very interesting relation between the accretion rate of massive black holes and star formation rate. Yes. What's the percentage uh, of dark matter that's involved in accretion? To you mean how much black hole growth is due to the accretion of dark matter? That's right. Okay, well, it's hard to know for sure because we don't know a whole lot about the dark matter, but, but generally, we don't think it's very much. And that's because the, the dark matter has trouble cooling effectively down to where it can sufficiently lose enough specific angular momentum to actually create onto the black hole. You need, to, you need to lose orders of magnitude of specific angular momentum to make it down to the black hole's mouth. And it's, it's very tough for even the gas to do that. Well, it could be affected by the, the matter. Um, yes, okay, well, I know people who have done, I know people who have done calculations um, Jerry Gilmore actually does some calculations estimating how much black hole growth you can get from dark matter. And it doesn't appear to be very much. So I don't think most of the, and I can, I can give you several reasons why, but I'll give you a couple of other points about that. Um, I didn't talk about this here, but another thing we can do, just to address that a little bit further, um, is we can use a famous argument called the Soltan argument, which I'm sure some of you know. It's been around for 40 years now or something. So we can take all of the x-ray sources, if we turn off the lights again, all the x-ray sources in our field, and we can add up how much black hole growth they represent. Right? And we can integrate that over cosmic time. And we compare the integrated amount of black hole growth from the standard accretion that we can see, and we can compare that to the local mass density of black holes in the local universe. And to within a factor of two, because these arguments have some uncertainty in the volumetric corrections and things like that. Um, there is some uncertainty, but to within a factor of two, the accretion that we see matches the local mass density of black holes. So if black holes were growing via, very substantially via some mode like accretion of dark matter, they wouldn't be producing luminous radiation on account of that. And so that tells you right there, there's no reason to suspect that there has to be any dark matter there. The growth that we see can explain naturally the black hole mass density we see in the local universe. So there's no reason to think that there's any additional trickery going on. The simplest explanation seems to work. Yes. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's thank Neil again. Thank you. Thank you.